He's a wonderful God. He gave the cross for us. Praise the Lord. We've been talking about uh, taking authority and taking responsibility. Thank you. Taking responsibility. And there are a number of things that we've got into uh, after that that still support the same, the same message that God has been giving to us. And this is because of what God has called us for. Not only in this city, but in this nation and wherever God will send you. Praise the Lord. You have a responsibility. One of the things I've been asking, which I'll ask you today, imagine if man never fell. You get know what I mean? What would you be up to? Imagine if we were in a perfect world. Adam and Eve never sinned. What would, you, what would be your purpose on earth? Because as Christians, many times we are so preoccupied with going back to heaven, which is a good thing. Of course, we look forward to heaven, our eternal home. Praise the Lord. We are preoccupied with dealing with the devil. We are preoccupied with every other thing that is only because of the fall. What if we went back to original setting, default setting? and figured out what was the plan. He said, let us make man in our own image and let's give them dominion. He wanted to extend a kingdom. And when the devil saw that, the devil was not happy with that. And that's why the fall came in. But after the fall came in, Jesus came and he undid what that fall had done. If our minds are renewed, to realize that we have been restored. Actually, we've been taken to a higher place than Adam and Eve were. We've been taken to a higher place than they were. Praise the Lord. Now, how do we reign from there? Because he has given us the mind of Christ. Yeah? We quote, we say, he's given us the mind of Christ. We say, we are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Yeah? Far above all principalities and all that. How do you reason when you are at that level? There is a place you come in God where the things that kept you busy, believing that they were spiritual growth, become very, for lack of a better word, obscene in that, in that place. Now in Song of Songs, I think it's 2.14, Now, if you're below 18, I'm not going to dwell so long on Song of Songs. But <laughs> he says, yeah, oh my dove, that art in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the stairs, let me see thy countenance. Let me hear thy voice, for sweet is thy voice. And thy countenance is calmly. You're beautiful. Now, many times we long for the presence of God. We pray to be in the presence of God. We desire to show up for such a meeting so that we are in the presence of God. But this shows us that God longs for our presence. Praise the Lord. Imagine God speaking to you. God longs for your presence also. And that is why there are certain disciplines that we put up. And people will think this is legalistic, you're falling from grace, but you're not falling from grace. You say, God, I, I want to wake up every morning at five. I want to spend time with you. Imagine God looks forward to that time. He longs for your presence. When will they show up? And you will see that right from Genesis. You see, God sending Moses to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt, it is because God longed for their presence. God longed for their presence. And before meeting them, he said, Moses, prepare them. Let them do this and this. I'll meet them tomorrow. That was his longing. And the children of Israel showed up. They said, we are not interested. I'm paraphrasing. They were so scared. He said, speak to Moses. Whatever he tells us, we will do. They gave up that. He says, you are beautiful. Your countenance is calmly. Go to verse 15. 
take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. He's saying, take us the little foxes. If you, I think from verse 13 is where he says, come away. In other words, come out of all that destruction. And some of the things that he calls us to come away from, one of the things that we've, we just, we finished our series early this year, that was on the hawks of spiritual warfare. And why I called it the hawks of spiritual warfare is because a lot of what is taught in the name of spiritual warfare is not really spiritual warfare. Praise the Lord. It is taking children of God back to the place of bondage. Paul wants the Galatians not to be entangled again. You see, because coming to Christ, you're set free. When we come and sing and say, uh, uh, all authority is given unto you. I have power over this. The devil was defeated. Then we come and receive teachings of spiritual warfare that by the time we leave our service, we feel a bit inferior to the devil. Then we are being entangled again. And now, now that's what I'm saying. That Now that's obscene in this place. He has said, come away. Yeah? Come away with me. He's called the bride to the chamber, to the inner chamber. And he's saying, you look beautiful. Imagine, think about it if it was honeymoon, a real honeymoon. Praise the Lord. A marriage is going to be consummated. A honeymoon. And this groom has got his bride and tells the bride, oh, we had a wonderful wedding. Now come, remove that wedding gown. Now put on something beautiful for me. Praise the Lord. Now, whatever your mind has told you that is beautiful, that's, that, <laughs> that's it. Now... <laughs> Yes. <laughs> A t-shirt of sports pesa or whatever. <laughs> but you know, now he says, come into, you know, he's called you, come into this chamber, the innermost chamber. That's where the, the groom makes love to his bride. So he told you, come there. And you're like, uh, you know, babe, I'm, I'm a school dropout. You know, that's obscene in that moment. Isn't it? At that time, he is worshipping you. At that time, he has qualified you even where others disqualified you. At that time, you are perfect. You're beautiful. You're everything. And that is where God has brought us. Because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Because of what the cross did. So imagine whenever God brings us to such a place, then we tell him, God, you know I'm not worthy. We tell him, God, you know, uh, 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 our family is like this. God, you know, that, 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 that spirit is in seven generations of our family. You know, that's obscene. It is so sad that we stand in the presence of God and we tell God how what we are dealing with is for generations. God. You tell God that, God, this thing is for... God, I come to you. This time, I've not even eaten. This is serious. It is for generations. <sighs> and you know, you're calling him God. Actually, after you've even worshipped, you are Yahweh. You are Yahweh. You are Yahweh. Alpha and Omega. Alpha and Omega, the generations are between there. But you know... <laughs> You know, after calling him Yahweh, you come and tell him, God, this thing is for generations. I know we may not finish it today, but I've committed two weeks to deal with it. You postpone your deliverance. You postpone your breakthrough. Because, you know, you think that you're coming to an MCA or you think that you've come before a chief in your village. Now, Adam didn't struggle with such things. Even when the devil himself came before Adam, you see that when God came to Adam, God reprimanded Adam because God didn't think the devil was so big. Now, demons that the devil sends, we talk about them before God and we think they are going to take four months to break. Yet God expected Adam to deal with the devil without even first covering his head or, you know, looking for anointing oil or whatever. But God expected him to deal with the devil. You turn to your neighbor and tell them, you are higher than you think. Because of what Jesus Christ has done, he has taken you to a very high place. 
If we never understand this, we're not going to take authority. We're not going to take responsibility. Because everywhere we will be, we will always feel inferior. We will always feel inferior. And that is why uh, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, he says, He made him known sin become sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. Now, righteousness, righteousness, the righteousness he's talking about here is imputed righteousness. Righteousness by faith. Praise the Lord. But the original meaning of righteousness is spotless. That's what it means. I know that we've understood righteousness by faith. Many times we, we, don't, we don't understand that righteousness means spotless. But that's what it meant. If someone means not fit for use. Praise the Lord. In college, I did a bit of veterinary medicine. Praise the Lord. And, yeah, a bit. There are classes I missed. I was read as, yeah, as preaching in a church. They say, <laughs> you know, one time a student saw me during an exam and was like, ah, you, you're not a pastor, you, you're a student, you know. It's like sometimes I just think that you just came to college to just, you're our pastor, you're like chaplain, our pastor, you're like chaplain. <laughs> and we, are, we were both in the same exam room. <laughs> and I was being checked for my ID also. <laughs> it's like the chaplain is being checked. I realized, no, he's not the chaplain. Because <laughs> I, I, I was preaching more than I was going to class. Don't try that. Praise the Lord. <laughs> it's dangerous. Very dangerous. But one of the things that we learned was meat inspection. And when you go to an abattoir, a, a slaughterhouse, and yes, you're given, now they will slaughter, and sometimes those things are on conveyor belts, so a carcass will come, and you check for some, there are vital things to check for. So you check the liver for liver flukes. So if the liver has liver flukes, you condemn. So you put a red mark on that carcass. It's condemned. It's not fit for consumption. It is condemned. Praise the Lord. Because as long as there are liver flukes, the eggs can be anywhere. You get what I mean? And you're not going to destroy them by boiling the meat. You can boil in your mom's clay pot for the whole night. And you will still fall sick. And so that means it's not fit for use. It's not fit for consumption. Engineers, architects also do the same. Isn't it? They will say, this building is condemned. Maybe they saw a crack in the foundation. They saw a crack somewhere. They will condemn it. They will put an X on the building, meaning it's not fit for use. Now, when the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is now therefore no condemnation. God is saying, none of you is regarded not fit for use. That is what he's referring to. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And the earlier our mind is renewed to the righteousness that we have been given, the better for us. Because that's when we will take responsibility. As long as you are a bit condemned, you will never fully take responsibility. Have you seen, sometimes, I know some of you may have gone through this, maybe you were adopted into a family. And the first many months or many days that you were adopted into that family, you are not so sure if you are really a son or a daughter in that family. As everyone ran to the free, because we are not so sure, we, we, we will be thinking, maybe if pastor showed up, he's the right person to speak to this. And that is how, that, that is how we also deal with the devil. The greatest revelation that ever occurred to me when it comes to deliverance, casting out demons and all that. And the truth is that, I've done all that, and I still do all that. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Many times when people hear me talk like this, they think I don't believe in casting out demons. You try to manifest yours right now. <laughs> but that, it's not a threat. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. But the greatest revelation, <laughs> guys, behave. The greatest revelation that occurred to me in that, because I got, I, 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 I started casting out demons 
way early because I saw that in my home. You see, possessed people were brought to my dad. Yes, mad people were brought to my dad. Mad. I saw mad people. What is the polite word for mad? You know, when we grew up, all these terms were not sensitive, you know. You, 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 we just said them like that. Or mentally ill. Or mentally challenged, yes. Mentally challenged. So mentally challenged people were brought into our home. <laughs> YouTube you had, I corrected, honestly. Mentally challenged people were brought. And you see, I would see my dad cast demons out of those people. And they would walk out of our home sober. Praise the Lord. Yeah, so there, there, there is no time in my life where I, I, I got scared because somebody was manifesting. Because I think before I could fully understand, I saw it happen in our house. I saw it happen where my dad was ministering and got into it. So when I, when I got into high school, of course, I, I, I was like the veteran. As everyone is running away, I remembered what dad did. Like, out in the name of Jesus, out. And you see, during that time when I was in high school, of course, I got into a lifestyle that didn't really show that I was a child of God. Praise the Lord. Sometimes I smelled like I had already been in hell. Chimney, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like the testimony, yes. So, yeah. so sometimes smoke came out of my nose and, you know, you'd think I'm just fresh from hell. So, do you, but I, as a believer, I loved God, but my lifestyle didn't, didn't represent that. And during that time, I, I, I started thinking, I'm unfit, I'm condemned. I didn't say it that way, but I would see it later, even after, even after that had changed, when my life totally turned around, I stopped smoking, I stopped drinking, I stopped doing all that, that we would get into a place, maybe we are ministering and demons are manifesting, especially because I did a lot of high school ministry also, and at times in my mind, I would feel like maybe it is a senior person who should deal with that. You see? What does that mean? I'm feeling condemned. Feeling condemned is not just feeling guilty. Yeah. As long as you feel like you cannot do what God has called you to do. Many times that is condemnation. That's what he calls condemnation. And during that time, now that is when the revelation of his righteousness came to me. And the revelation of his righteousness is to set us back to that place where he had wanted us to be, or beyond that. He asked Adam, who told you you've sinned? Adam felt condemned. Praise the Lord. And because God had his agenda of us occupying, having dominion, turning this world into sort of a little heaven, his culture to be experienced all over this world. Praise the Lord. When Adam fell, God had a solution very fast. And that was Jesus Christ to come and die on the cross and undo what Adam had done so that the dominion mandate can continue, so that the kingdom mandate can continue. So if we get born again and not understand our righteousness, not get hooked up to the mandate that he has for us, we do things that are spiritual exercise and we feel like it is spiritual growth Yet in that secret chamber, it would be like it's obscene. You get what I mean? Instead of occupying, we think that the highest level of spirituality is dealing with a demon, is dealing with a generational curse, is dealing with this. There is a lot at stake, and the devil can preoccupy you with that because he knows the main goal. If you're preoccupied with that, you will not do what God has called you to do. Praise the Lord. That you're meant to take charge in the office that he's called you in. You may take charge in the business area that he's called you to. It is your platform, like we've always said. It is your platform. It is not the calling, but it is the platform that God has given you. That in such a place, you should have a mark of eternal value. Praise the Lord. That is why he gave you righteousness. He gave you righteousness so that you never feel unfit for what he has called you to do. Praise the Lord. And tells us not to get well adjusted to the culture of the world around us. Not to be dragged down to their level. In Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. But for us to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. 
Now the testimony we've just had from legislature. That's a testimony of somebody whose mind has been renewed. Imagine because of what that gentleman said to her. All her life feeling like I am unfit. I am unfit. Now that is condemnation that the devil brings in, which is not meant for you as a child of God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. When we read Joshua 24, verse 15, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, that's in Egypt, or the gods of Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me, in my house, we will serve the Lord. As for me, Joshua made a decision that for me and my family, in other words, Joshua and the next generation would serve the Lord. Praise the Lord. God has called us to that. The responsibility that we have is very great. We have been given imputed righteousness. That is like it is a problem that has, is solved. Because God is so determined to see his agenda come to pass. And it's so sad that many times the agenda is lost at some generations. I have, I have studied a bit on the moves of God. And I always wonder, why is it that at, at one time there is a real disconnect? You get to a place, I've been told, I've not been there, but in LA, Los Angeles, in uh, Azusa Street, I was told where the Azusa movement, where the revival sprang from, there is a Japanese restaurant there right now. Imagine the things that are happening in LA today. If you go there and walk on that street, you know, you would be like, really? Is this where? Is this where the move happened? Maybe even the people who work in that restaurant know nothing about the move. Maybe apart from the people who come there and ask. And it's the same thing I was seeing about this nation, Kenya. Before I came to Kenya, I studied a lot about Kenya. My dad got born again. He was led to Christ by Apostle Jokai. When he visited Uganda, Apostle Jokai was very key in the move of God here from the, what, 50s, 60s, 70s, up to maybe the early 80s. And hearing this testimony, seeing the great things that happened in Kenya. And you see, when I came, I'm like, wow, I'm going to see that. I can't wait to visit all these places in Kenya. You're the ones concluding. I've not yet finished my story. I, I, I didn't say whatever you're saying. But you see, that was, that, that's what bothered me. I'm like, so where are the people that sat under this man? And where are the people that sat under them? Like, 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 like we need to see posterity of what was seen during that time. Yes, me and my house, like Joshua says. And... The first generation that encountered God, I saw a man of God illustrate it this way. Now the first generation is a generation that you can call sold out. They are sold out for God. Now, Joshua was in that generation because Joshua was very close to Moses. Everyone that was led by Moses, they were that generation. They saw God. They saw the works of God. They saw the Red Sea part. They saw the plagues. They saw everything. And they were fully sold out to God. So committed. Their values were kingdom values. And they stuck to those kingdom values. That is what impacted them. Praise the Lord. And we see it even today. Some of you have come from such families. Your parent, your dad, your mom was the first believer in the family. And you saw how they were sold out. They made many mistakes. But those mistakes were because they really felt like they were following God. Praise the Lord. I know a generation of when the healing movement hit, people who refused to take their children to hospital, they refused to go to hospital. And some of them died. So those are the mistakes I'm talking about. 
And at times it is because of that. Deep in their hearts they were convicted that if I go to hospital, I'm sinning. You get what I mean? People who refuse to live well because they believe that living well is against spirituality. Whatever they had, they just took to the church. Houses with no plumbing, no what. Those were sold out generations. And you see, today we preach to correct that. But if you look back, you realize that many of those generations were a more powerful church. They had more impact than we have today. We have more knowledge, but with less impact. Because you see, you look back and you're like, with the little knowledge they had, see how much they did. It is because they were fully sold out. Then a generation came that saw these things. Now, there's a generation, the children of Joshua, and the children of the people that were Joshua's peers. That generation grew up in families of sold out people. Now, if you grew up in a family of sold out lovers of God, you realize a majority of you, by 15, you are already born again. Majority of you. By 15, you're already born again. Yes, you're already born again. Maybe not filled with the Holy Ghost, or not, but you knew. And you realize that in many of those families, almost every child is born again. Almost every child is born again. It is, do, do, do you see the advantage of being sold out for God? You save a generation. You, your children see more than they hear. Yeah, you, you, you go and try to look around. Go and try to look around for such a family. Look around for families where by university, all the children were loving God, fully sold out to God. You realize that the parents were a fully sold out generation. Now, the second generation were the generation that they had the things. They didn't see them. They watched their parents. Their parents lived with conviction because they saw. Their parents are the ones that walked through the Red Sea. Their parents are the ones that saw water come out of a rock. Their parents saw all that. So their parents kept telling those stories. For their parents, family altar was a must. Not going to church was not in their vocabulary. Praise the Lord. You didn't sag your pants. Yes, you put them at the waist. You, you know, you, <laughs> I mean at the chest, sorry. <laughs> we, we, you know, yeah? Daniel was telling me yesterday in the service, I was talking about how my mom would, would, would really get hard time when we, we, we would rap or dance, you know, break dance and rap. And she's like, we are like, this, this is gospel music. She does, she's like, you can't even understand what they are singing. I'm like, mom, you're the one who can't understand. I can tell you. But you know, Daniel told me that his mom washed his mouth with soap because of rapping. <laughs> Sold out generation. Sold out generation. The, their, 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 their kingdom values were so high. And today we brand them as legalistic. You get what I mean? That is, we call them that. So now the generation that grew up under them, that generation is a generation we call compromised. They did not get lost. They did not get lost, but they were sustained because of their parents' faith. They went to church because there was no option in the home. Praise the Lord. They started tithing because their parents gave them 500 shillings and said, tithe. You, you get what I mean? Now bring the tithe. So they, they got into those things. So they did not get lost. They did not get lost, but they were compromised. And as they grow up as adults, you realize that they go to church, but they are critical of church. You get what I mean? They show up to church because it's a bad thing. How will their children see that they don't go to church? They are a bit hardened when you talk about things of the move of God, the fire of God, because they know them all. There's nothing new you're telling them. So it's such a generation. Their values are only so that their children can grow up a certain way. You get it? It is the generation that will drive to church as the husband and wife are quarreling, bickering, and doing all that, and... The children are seated in the back of the car and they are, they are seeing all this. And when they reach church, the dad just puts on his holy armor and gets out of that car 
and opens the door for the mom. And everyone is like, brother, so and so, you're welcome. Oh, the Lord has been good. The Lord is faithful. Shalom, yeah. So shalom, 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 shalom. And the children are watching and they're like, wow. Who is this? That's not my dad. And in church, the pastor says, brother, so and so has a very powerful testimony. And they show up and the child is waiting to hear what is this testimony, I do not know. And they get here, they hold the microphone. The moment they hold the microphone, the anointing comes upon them. And suddenly. <laughs> and they speak in some tongues before they start sharing the testimony. And the children are like, who is that? And when they are leaving, the wife comes very close and holds their hand and they go back and sit together. And when they get home, there is no altar because the dad is still watching news. There is no family altar. Children, go pray on your own in the bedroom. But at church, they are different. Now, those children are the third generation, which is called conflicted. They are conflicted. Yeah. Against the word of God, with the word of God, with the values of God. Because they saw their parents say things that their parents did not live, did not believe. And that generation is normally hard to get born again, to get transformed. It becomes very hard for that generation because that generation is a carnal generation. That generation is a generation that wants proof for everything, carnal proof. It's very hard for them to come into spiritual reality. Because with spiritual reality, you have to open your heart by faith and say, Lord, I'm willing to test and see that you are good. Now, this generation wants to, I can't feel it. Why? Because that's what they saw at home. Praise the Lord. 1 Corinthians 2.14 tells us that the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Now, this is a very natural generation. Very natural. Very natural. Given to natural tendencies. This, this is what is happening in the world. Drawn to that, the values are, kingdom values are down. And Romans 8, 7 to 9, he tells us that the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. Imagine, it cannot be. That is why when you get born again, it gives you a new mind. It cannot be subject. And you see, isn't, isn't it amazing that some of us try to really argue with our family members about God? This should sort you. That mind is not subject to the things of God. An argument is not going to make them subject to the things of God. Until there is a new mind, until that heart is supplanted and it is replaced with a heart of flesh. Praise the Lord. A heart that the king can indwell. Now, do you see how normally the move of God is lost? Because see, the second generation, the compromised one, the compromised ones, they are Christians. They, so they are Christians. They believe in God, but they are not fully out there. But they believe in God. And normally, they play a great role in ending what God has begun. Because there is nothing you can tell them. They saw it all. Say, ah, do you know how many people we saw healed? Do you know how many people we saw filled with the Holy Do you know we... What are you telling us? They sit in church and they on WhatsApp the entire service. Nothing is appealing to them. And the children are monitoring because the children come with them to church. And the children see the word is going on. And so the pastor is saying, value the word of God. And to the children, they feel like this is acting. They feel like this is theater. That's what the pastor is meant to say when he's up there. Because if it was serious, dad would take it seriously. Mom would take it seriously. But mom does not take it seriously. I sing, read your Bible, pray every day, pray every day. They get home, they've never seen dad read the Bible. They've never seen mom read the Bible. When guests come from church, dad leads family altar. Dad pulls out his Bible and dusts it. You know, 
Yes. So they realize, so you see how that generation becomes conflicted? Now that is the generation that we are going for. Many testimonies that we've had here. These university students that have been transformed. We have a number of university students that have come from drinking, that have come from fornication. And many of them tell, we have Wilson shared his testimony with us. And you see, Wilson, yeah, Wilson is at the back there. Wilson was preached to at a pub, university student, at a pub drinking on a Friday evening. Yes, from lectures, go drink, go sleep around. Now, Wilson has won many souls right now. Many souls. He's on fire for God. Less than I am born again. We were in Kitale. He was casting out demons. He was one of the people casting out demons among, from those people. But you see, when Wilson got born again on fire for God, he was filled with the Holy Ghost. He went home and he led his parents to rededicate themselves to God. Praise the Lord. How are we going to reach this generation if we are not fully sold out? Because if we are sold out, then we can flow in the power of God without being co feeling condemned. You get what I mean? Because the power of God is free. The gifts of God are without repentance. But many times we don't see the manifestation because we feel condemned. And the Bible says that if your heart condemns you, God is greater. So it's not God who condemns. But just because you're not sold out, you get to a place where you condemn yourself. If you're sold out, you come to a place where you stand and you know you have this. Oh, I saw that with my parents. My parents were sold out. They were first generation. My mom came from a family that was in witchcraft. She got born again and her dad didn't like her for many months because her dad wanted to get a sheep to sacrifice in a shrine. And my mom told her, I am born again. I no longer participate in that. And my dad is like, I took you to school. I've raised you that way. You survived in school because of that witchcraft. You know, that's, that's, that's what he thought. Now, the persecution she went through. So imagine as children, we saw somebody who is fully sold out. Fully sold out. Praise the Lord. Not compromising. And that had a mark on us. So even now, dear people say, oh, Christians are hypocrites and what? At home, I saw a different story. One time we, I've told this story before, but one time we had the, the house keys had been misplaced. And it is late at night we had come back and we tried everything to open those locks and we could not. And dad told us, now we are going to lay hands on the door and we are going to pray. You get what I mean? Those locks didn't open that day. But do you know what that did to us as children? This man believes this thing. Yes, it is not just something he says in church. He built, by the time a man can tell his family, let's lay hands on this, yeah? A man, a graduate, a professional, yeah? You get what I mean? Now, those things showed us. Times we didn't have food and he said, let's pray until food comes. One time we prayed until somebody knocked on the door and brought in fruits. And we just ate fruits for dinner. Now, to us as children, we are seeing such things in you can imagine the mark they are leaving on us. Like, wow, this thing is real. It's true people out there may be pretending, they may be hypocrites, but with what we've seen. One day my, my brother fainted. My young brother, he's called Emmanuel. He fainted. We were playing. I think he had had a fever, or, but he fainted. So he's, did he faint or he was just convulsing? And, you know, and normal, and, and it was common around our area because of malaria and all that. People would convulse, they get convulsions and and the, you would see people rushing them, carrying them, a neighbor carrying a child, they tilt their head, you know, for blood to get to the head, get on a board, a board and take them to hospital. It was a common thing. But you know, we are there and we are like, what is happening? My dad came out of the house, grabbed my brother, went to the backside of the house. You know, we, are, we are think he's going to run to hospital. We went to peep, he's there speaking in tongues, speaking in tongues. And he came back with him walking. And, you know, now I'm seeing such things as a child. God has called us as a ministry to bring back that. Let me tell you, it is weird. There are many people who feel out. Now, nowadays, if you feel, if you love God, if you're passionate and you, you are to that extreme, you are the one that is marginalized. 
you are too preachy, you are too religious. That's what they say. You are too serious. You are Christian. But God called us and God said, let us make a home where all such people can come and feel comfortable. Praise the Lord. Yes. That is why people come and tell me, Pastor, I'm believing that my car battery will just work. I never tell them no. You get what I mean? I never tell them no. I never tell them no. Yes, gas. Yeah. We've had electricity tokens refilled twice. 53. During the time we were praying and fasting, we had cars fuel refilled. Now you may say, oh, I don't believe it. Let me tell you, I'm not telling you to believe it. I'm just showing you how crazy we are. Because we don't want the next generation to ever think that God does not work. To ever think that God is not powerful. To ever think that God is not real. Yes, I don't want my daughter to grow up conflicted. I don't want my daughter to grow up saying, we read about healing, but I've never seen it exercised anyway. That is why, you see, when we have healing meetings, we want our children to be there. We have a service called Captured in Glory. We have our children. They come for that service five years, and they are slain under the power of God. They are filled with the Holy Spirit. And other people will say, that is too much for children. They say, why, why do you get children into this? Can't you let them grow and make their choice? You know, when, when, when it's church, they tell us, leave the children to grow up and make their own choice. When it comes to kindergarten, you wake that small kid short like this. You wake them up at four. Put a, an oversized school bag on, the, uh, on their back. An oversized sweater. And wait for the school bus in that call. The kid is still dozing. Why don't you give them a choice to choose? We value God more than we value school. God is important. God is important. God is important. Yes, God is important. And let me tell you, you are in the right place. You are, you, the next generation shall not be lost. They will not be lost. Because if we are to take responsibility, because you see, whatever we've been talking about taking responsibility can easily be misinterpreted. Because you see, I've told you, be excellent at your place of work. I've told you, be, 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 like, be the best you can be. Praise the Lord. Save money. Invest. Become rich. And you see, it helps you to propagate the kingdom. But you see, the problem is when people who are not sold out get these principles and apply them. Exactly. Because you see, we have a lot of that. Many times you find that we are short of fully sold out Christians to come and share testimonies of the marketplace. Because the ones who are in the marketplace, they took the principles without first being sold out. Get sold out. Yeah, they are compromised. Get sold out before you apply, before you get the principles. When Jesus called the disciples, he said, I will make you. He made them first. They stayed with him. They dwelt in the secret place of the Most High. He told them, tarry in Jerusalem until you endured with power. Then they went out. Because somebody can easily come to church to sit because we talk good about excellence. And so they are excellent. And they think that's our Christian, that, 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 that's the highest value of a Christian. What is going to happen to the generation of that man? The children are going to be very competent businessmen, but heathen. Yes. Because the dad was a Christian and his greatest testimony was how he's flourishing in business. So the children are going to be flourishing in business, but they are going to, be, to bring same-sex marriages. They are going to bring, that's what they are going to do. Because they were sure that that's the highest value. The highest value is to make it in the economy. The highest value is to make it in school. They are not sure this. And that is what the, the Israelites saw. And the Bible says in, in, in Psalms, it says that they limited the Holy One of Israel. They limited the Holy One of Israel. Why? They did not bring to remembrance the great things that God had done. Imagine limiting God. Because we say God cannot be limited, but he says they limited him. Because God has chosen to work through people. So people can limit him on earth. There is a lot he wants to do. Praise the Lord. God wants no street child in, this, in the streets. God wants no orphan going hungry. God wants no widow going hungry. Maybe we've limited him. Praise the Lord. I want to get up on your feet.